this, this is going to be a lot of fun. I've known Kareem for a long time. He is one of the most important people in my life. He's one of the smartest individuals that I know. Kareem, I thank you for everything you have, you, you've done for me and for all of us because I was talking a little while ago about how you make us think, and we don't, we don't do enough thinking um, today. And this is your first, your first political book. Yeah. And I'd like for you to talk about why it has taken you so long to write this political book and what made you think about doing that. Well, uh, basically, I, I didn't have the confidence to write it up to a certain point. And then uh, I realized that uh, maybe I, I had the chops and uh, certainly certain things need to be said. Um, this book is, uh, it, the book is called um, Writings on the Wall, which, which you've all seen. And um, it, it's based on different things that I've observed over the past couple of years while I've been writing for Time, Inc about what's happening in our country. And some of it's very alarming. You know, the, the, uh, the fracturing of uh, so many alliances that, that have uh, withstood the t test of time and now they're falling apart. And um, there's gridlock in Washington and uh, people are scared. Uh, people are concerned about their job. Uh, upward mobility is no longer the thing that it was that uh, made the American dream seem so attainable. So I think there are a lot of things going on that uh, we all should be concerned about. And uh, this book uh, that so many of you have gotten uh, this evening, this is my attempt to uh, address that issue. Now, one other thing you should know, ladies and gentlemen, is that Kareem at one time did a little studying in, in journalism, right? Yes. So he's qualified to tell me I don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> and other writers, they don't know what they're talking about. But how is it that journalism helped you in this particular instance? Well, I, I think just uh, when I started paying attention to, to what happened in America on a daily basis, uh, really was back when I was eight years old, 1955, and uh, the murder of Emmett Till. And that, that really concerned me, and I didn't understand it. I tried to talk to my parents about it. They didn't have the words to explain it to me. And so I just started paying attention. And I remember um, we would watch uh, Walter Cronkite almost every night to see what was happening with the civil rights movement. And um, it, it just got into my blood and it, it's something that I've been concerned about, uh, truth, justice, and um, equality for, for all Americans is, is an issue. And um, this enables me to uh, address those issues and speak my mind on it. Because you got involved at a very early age when most of us would be concerned about playing football, baseball, basketball, and stuff like that, you were already formulating your ideas and opinions and your thoughts on how to make us a better community, a better nation. Yeah, I, I think that the, the key moment in all of that was between my uh, junior and senior year in high school, I, I took part in a mentoring program in Harlem. And um, they said that the, the whole idea was to challenge us to, to see how we could make Harlem a better place. And we had to find out about our community and understand it, and then uh, understand what to do about it. And um, that really, it, it really changed my life because it made me understand how important Harlem was uh, for black Americans and all the things that had, had happened there. You know, a ver very special place. And it, it was my home, you know, so I, um, took a lot of pride in it and uh, had pride in my community and wanted to see it uh, become a better place. How long did it take to do Writings on the Wall? Uh, writings on the Wall really was pretty easy to do because uh, Raymond and I, Raymond Obstelt is my co-author, we, we used the articles that I've done for uh, Time Inc. as uh, a basis and we expanded them and made them in more depth, and by doing that, uh, ended up with a, with a whole book. Yeah. That's right. How, how big a, a role has sports played in you writing all these books and getting the word out? Uh, because it gave you a, and it gives you a terrific platform to spread the word to really educate us all. Well, just uh, the attention that you get as a professional athlete uh, you, you enter a lot of people's lives. I, I remember when I was a kid, I was a Brooklyn Dodgers fan. I was nuts about the Brooklyn Dodgers, man. I loved them. Uh, 
Jackie Robinson and Duke Snyder and Roy Campanella and Pee Wee and all those guys, Carl Erskine, wow. Um, I would have done anything they wanted to do. When Jackie Robinson got involved in the Freedom National Bank, uh, which opened up in Harlem, I went down there with my $55 and put it in the bank because I, I thought that that was uh, what I should be doing. Jackie said, yeah, come on down to Freedom National Bank. <laughs> <laughs> come so, on down. Yeah, yeah come on down. Mm -hmm. So uh, because of that, because just the status that athletes have for so many people, especially uh, young people, uh, you know, they they inspire us uh, and give us uh, an idea of what we can do with our lives. And uh, because of that, I, I, I've used my status in that way. Do you, you feel like you're getting, in this book, Writings on the Wall, do you feel like you're getting the message out? Do you feel like people are starting to pay attention to the issues that you that we all see that are out there? Oh yeah, I, I'm, I'm sure they do because there's nothing in there about hoops. You know, it's it's all about what we experience as American citizens and why, and just my take on why it's working and and why it's not working. You talk extensively about institutional racism, and I'd like for you to talk about that because there are that's a phrase that a lot of people hear, but very few people know it or understand exactly what it means. When you write it in, in your book, what does that mean? Okay, institutional racism has to do with the fact that certain people are marginalized, marginalized in our, our society. Women, people of color. So all the women and all the people of color, color the way it works in, in your adult life is that you're the last hired and you're the first fired. And women also have a, a glass ceiling on how much money they can make. They can't make as much money as uh, men make. And people of color don't make as much money as people from Europe make. And this is, this, th there's a whole tradition of this. This, this all started uh, with the Three-Fifths Compromise uh, right after the Continental uh, Convention where we came up with the Constitution. They had the Three-Fifths Compromise which said that uh, black people were three-fifths of a human being and um, they could not vote. And this just went forward from there until we had the Civil War. After the Civil War, black people uh, were supposedly able to vote, but they had another compromise where the federal government stopped protecting the rights of black people to vote. That was approximately 1870, 1875, the end of um, the aftermath of, this, of the Civil War, what they call Reconstruction. And in the South, where uh, the Confederate states were, Black people were again denied the right to vote through various means. And uh, that persisted up until the 1960s. So, you know, that, that's almost, uh, that is 100 years. You had 100 years of that. And it hasn't been that long since the 1960s that uh, black people and other people of color have been trying to overcome the disadvantages that they inherited from the way that they've been uh, marginalized in our country. So something has to be done about it. And what's the something? Because I, I know you talk about, in your book and in, and in other books, you talk about education is the key. And we've all heard that before, about education being the key. But you take it a step further when you talk about the process of education and how we can use education and take it to the next level. Yeah, we, we can use that education to get to the next level uh, when there is equal access. But if there is an equal access, it, it'll, there will always be one segment of society that gets uh, preference over the others. And I think that is, part of the, that is part of the issue for so many people that support Donald Trump because they see now if there's going to be real equality, then having a white skin and a European background isn't going to be that much of an advantage. It's going to be about what you bring to the party, what, what your skills are. And that's what it should be, you know? Uh, America is supposed to be a, a meritocracy, but uh, for, a long, for the longest time it was meritocracy for people from Europe and everybody else had to get in line and hope they could get a job. And um, that hasn't served uh, all of our country that well. That's starting to change. And also the, the complexion of um, our republic is, is getting a little bit browner. And <laughs> there's, there's nothing wrong with that. You know, 
I saw all those guys that were cheering for Holly Berry uh, when she went up for the Academy Award, so I know, <laughs> I know that they don't really mind that. But uh, this is something we all have to, we have to think about this because it, it's so ingrained in our culture, people take it for granted. Um, just like what happened in Ferguson, uh, Missouri. That was a direct result of black Americans not understanding that they had to vote, they had to run for office, they have to not get arrested. Uh, they have to understand what the city council is talking about. And they got to go down there and, and f once they find out what they're talking about, make their voices heard. And how do you do that? Uh, President Obama has said it a number of times. Don't boo, vote. That's, the vote is the, the thing that makes us all equal and gives us all an, an equal voice in this republic. And uh, when people don't get involved, bad things happen. So you end up with a police force that doesn't know who you are and doesn't care because they uh, deal with the people who control their salaries. And when they know that the, all the people control their uh, salaries, even the brown and black ones, they'll start treating the brown and black people a lot better. It's like we're all listening to a, um, a walking, talking, library tonight, isn't it? <laughs> Just to listen to the, the, the education uh, that you have. Be you were at the Democratic Convention. Yes. You saw that? Me, me. Did you see him go up on, on the platform in front of, I don't know how many millions of people and say, hi, this is Michael Jordan? Did you guys see that? <laughs> you guys see that? Um, why did you decide not only to go to the convention, but to speak at the convention when you could have just kind of stayed back just a little bit? Well, I, I thought I should let people know how concerned I was and the, the issue that they had me address, uh, just uh, the fear and loathing of Muslims because of the barbaric things that are happening in the Middle East. Uh, American Muslims don't have any, anything to do with that. Uh, by and large, you know, not, over 99% of American Muslims are loyal, faithful citizens. Uh, some of them have tried to, to join ISIS, but by and large, Americans, Muslims are uh, loyal citizens. And um, I understand how so many Americans want to strike back at the people from ISIS, but American Muslims don't, they don't want to be with ISIS. They want to be here in America. They, they really enjoy it here. You can take my word for it. You can <laughs> <laughs> because <laughs> just the fact that you can practice your faith as, as you see fit, they can't do that in the Middle East. Uh, the rights of women are not respected in the Middle East. And that goes directly against what the Quran says. The Quran says that women should have the ability to choose their husbands, the ability to petition for divorce, the right to own and inherit property. And most importantly, the Quran says that you are partners one to the other. They're talking about Muslim men and Muslim women. You are partners. That lends itself to equality, not uh, chauvinism. And the, the chauvinist uh, regimes and authoritarian governments of, of the Middle East do not respect the, the rights of women. This goes directly against what the Quran says. So even though these people say that they're Islamic, they're not Islamic. They don't even understand the, whole, the book that they carry around with them, they don't read it. And that, that's really a shame, and um, it's uh, really affected so many lives to the in a negative way. That, that has to change. Because at one time when you were playing for the Lakers, you had some issues yourself to whereas, um, and, I don't, and it's not a big secret now, you had to have security guards because of, because of your, your faith. And the person, I might add, who was in charge of, uh, did a lot of security work for you, is now the mayor of Inglewood, James Butts. Wow. Uh, yeah, James Butts, see, James Butts, the mayor of Inglewood, was assigned to protect this man. Okay? That goes to show you how crazy things can get. Yeah, it can get crazy, yeah, absolutely. And some of us wondered, how in the heck, can I say it, H E W L? Yeah, some of us are wondering, how the hell did you do it, man? When you had all this noise around you and all these crazy people with all these threats, and you went out and performed like no one else could. 
Well, Jim, you know, to me it was important that um, I do my job to the best of my ability and not give in to fear, you know, because fear is, uh, it, it kills your ability to think clearly mm -hmm. and you can't give in to it. You know, you have to uh, take whatever risk that you have to take in order to do the right thing. And I, I've always believed in that. Because when, when you think about it, ladies and gentlemen, this isn't something that Kareem just started doing last month, last year, the last five years. We go way, we go back and we look at, at uh, your record where the Olympics, you didn't even want to play in the Olympics. I couldn't play in the Olympics. Uh, Avery Brundage was the chairman of the American Olympic Committee, and Avery Brundage was the individual who told the Jewish athletes on the 1936 Olympic team that they couldn't compete in Berlin because it made Hitler angry. And in 1968, when it was my turn to, to be in the Olympics, he was still the chairman of the Olympic Committee, and I knew about him, and I was not going to do a single thing for this individual. <laughs> It, it, it was for that reason that uh, Mac Robinson mm -hmm. got to run on the relay team because Marty Glickman, they wouldn't let Marty Gl Glickman uh, compete. Participate, yeah. So um, Jesse Owens, Mac uh, Robinson from Pasadena. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And then, and then there was a, a few years later when Muhammad Ali said, no, I'm not going to take that step forward. You, Jim Brown, and a few other uh, brave African-Americans stood behind Muhammad and his decision not to go. So you've been, you've been, you've been defending, uh, you've been uh, patrolling for equal, equal rights and everything else for a long time on a whole lot of levels. Yeah, I have, yeah. It's, it's, it's an important thing. Um, you know, Ali could have uh, made a lot of money and um, gotten a cushy ride through the uh, armed forces. All he had to do was just step forward, but he wouldn't do that, you know, and he, he did it for, for principle and he paid for it, but um, he, he ended up with his integrity intact and that was the most important thing to him. So he, he didn't care. Mm -hmm. How did Muhammad and his thoughts and beliefs help you? Well, I, I think I have to thank him for going through what he went through because he was so political. And for me, it wasn't uh, very much a political move. I, it was, for me, spiritual. I was kind of um, upset with, I was born and raised Catholic, and I was kind of upset with the Catholic Church's condolence of the slave trade. So I didn't want to have anything to do with him. And um, I figured I'd become Muslim. And, uh, it all made sense to me, and I, I haven't regretted it, really. Go ahead. You can clap for that. Sure. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Does the athlete of today do enough for all of us? But, let, but before, before he answers that, let me preface it by saying something else. A lot of times when an athlete reaches a certain financial level from a salary standpoint, all of a sudden, they become experts on everything. Right, yeah. Okay, so now, after saying that, does the athlete of today, and how can the athlete of today, black, white, blue, purple, polka dot, I don't care, how can he help the situations that we're going through so we can just get along on a, on a much better basis than we are right now? Well, I, I think today's athletes are, are doing a good job because they make so much money, they have the wealth to, to spend on solutions. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when we played, we didn't get paid that well. Although we got paid well, we didn't get paid no, that I well. No, I didn't. I, I don't, I'm not going to lie. No, I, <laughs> I, I, I know I didn't. <laughs> I know. I, I still, today, I, I meet people that think I got some of that Shaq money. <laughs> Shaq got that money. I didn't get that. <laughs> but... Um, I think t today's athletes do a good job now. Um, there were a couple of guys on the Cleveland Browns when uh, Tamir Rice got killed in Cleveland. They came out and spoke, out, uh, spoke about that because they realized that that could have been their son. It, a 12-year-old kid gets shot dead by the police for playing in the park uh, in, uh, in the morning. Jeez, that, that, that is a shame and a tragedy, and it shouldn't have happened. 
And um, some of the Cleveland Brown guys spoke out about it. And uh, some of the police from Cleveland didn't like it. But these guys said, no, we have to say that. And that's because they were, first and foremost, parents. And the future of their kids' lives meant a lot more to them than pissing off some, some of the cops in, in Cleveland. And I, I'm so glad that they spoke out. Uh, LeBron spoke out. And now uh, Carmelo Anthony and Dwayne Wade have spoken out. Dwayne just lost his cousin. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, she was murdered in um, Chicago by some people that were having uh, a gunfight and a stray bullet hit and killed her. Um, th this has got to stop. You know, some of the pathology in some of our poor neighborhoods has really gotten out of hand and uh, th something has to be done about it. And in the beginning, when certain athletes started to speak out, the question that I had was, why is it mostly basketball players? Because when you think about it, at the ESPYs, it was Carmelo and those guys standing on stage and, mm -hmm. and LeBron and stuff like that. And Chris then Paul. I, uh, hmm? Chris Paul. Chris Paul, yeah. yeah. But then I, started, then I started asking myself, why is it that other athletes and other sports, what's taking them so long to come forward? Is it because maybe they are, uh, their contracts aren't guaranteed? I don't know. I, I, I see other athletes doing good things, mm -hmm. you know, with their foundations and um, Clayton K Kershaw mm -hmm. uh, built schools in Africa. In Africa, yes. Yes. Um, Dikembe Mutombo built a hospital in his home country, in the Congo, where there's not, there weren't even roads there. He built a hospital there. I mean, so these guys, they have a lot of power, and they also have uh, financial power, and they can get things done. And I, I think that's great. And I, I think that what is possible for them has taken on a, an, a, an appeal, and um, they're filling in the blanks there where, uh, you know, the government should be involved in some of these issues. But if not, why not the individuals who care? Even Michael Jordan came out, and Michael doesn't come out for anything except collect right. check. Michael came out, I was so glad, and you know, he, he lost his dad uh, yeah. to senseless gun violence. So um, he had every reason to, to speak up earlier. But you know, better late than never. I, I'm, I'm so happy because so many people admire him and respect him, and they'll listen to what he has to say. Here's the next question, Cap, because that's how we affectionately call him, Cap. Can some athletes take this too far? And by that I mean, we have the Colin Kaepernick situation, whereas he was sitting down when the national anthem was being played. Now, some people might say, no, wait a minute, hold it, hold it. I can understand you wanting to do certain things for education, for, us, for our young people, you know, for, for civil rights and stuff like that. But when it comes to the flag, is that a different, is that a different situation? I, I think that that depends on your, your vantage point. So, some, I remember after Vietnam, some, a lot of Vietnam vets burned the American flag as a statement, not to show disrespect for our country. Um, so someone's gonna have to ask Colin what was his intention by not standing for the national anthem. Because if he, if he was disrespecting our country, that, that's really unfortunate. But if he's trying to call attention to the issues that are, are important to him, um, that, that is a very American tradition. And um, we you just have to take the time to speak to them and find out. You know? When you look at what you have been writing, and in particular this book, where do you get the best response? Is there a certain age group that responds to you more so than others? No, I, you know, I, I, I have young people come up to me and, and thank me for writing what I've written. And I have people my age uh, do the same thing. So, uh, you know, that, that's uh, it's a pretty big, big arc there of, of age. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I, I think that uh, some of the things I'm talking about um, are, are, are timeless and are very important and will not lose their important in, importance in, until we uh, deal with the issue and make it a thing of the past. Where'd you get your gift? Because I think that's what it is. I think the big coach in the sky, the big general manager in the sky, the big owner in the sky, reached down and said, Kareem, ding, you got this, buddy. But, but because I also, say, I also know there's a saying that he doesn't give you more than you can handle. 
Right. And for some of us, we can't handle a lot. You know what I mean? But for you and your, and your broad shoulders, you even wrote a book about you know, on, on being on shoulders and stuff like that. I, I think uh, just what I learned from my parents, and my mom would point out, when, all right, when I was a kid, she'd point out, listen to Jackie Robinson. He's articulate. He's smart. I want you to be like that. I, I took that to heart. I ended up at UCLA, right? <laughs> um, but I think I just followed the example of someone who I knew cared and was a courageous person. So Dr. King, uh, Malcolm X, people of that nature, uh, Adam Clayton Powell Jr., uh, the, who was the uh, representative uh, from Harlem. These are people who, who set an example of, of activism and uh, not being afraid to, to confront uh, power uh, with the truth and um, demand that uh, power be accountable. I, I think that this is a very American thing and I'm just following in that tradition. I remember one of the things that Dr. King wrote that I really like is giving back to your fellow mankind is one of the most noble things that anyone can do. Absolutely. Absolutely, and uh, if we don't if we don't care about our fellow citizens, about all of them, um, it's it's not gonna, our our republic isn't going to work. We got to care about everybody, and you, you can't worry about what color they are, or how they worship, or who they love, or anything like that. Uh, we got to accept everybody as an American citizen and, and work with them to make this a better place. Chicago's going through a whole heck of a lot right oh, now. Chicago, it's, it's it's too much. They, the, the murder rate is, is sky high. And uh, I just saw something uh, recently, th this past week, that said there's a whole lot of illegal guns coming into uh, Chicago from Indiana. And um, this guy, Mike Pence, who's running for vice president on the Republican ticket, he hasn't done anything about it. So uh, we, we've got to get people who care about uh, these issues and who can enact legislation. And you know, I, I'm not an advocate for uh, abolishing the Second Amendment, but uh, sensible gun ownership uh, makes so much sense for everybody. It's pretty bad right now? Or how bad is it really? I mean, because well, in, in, certain, in certain segments of our society, everything is fine. I mean, they have no problem. But when, when, you, th when you break it down to a family, a family of four or five where the average income is, you know, thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars a year, it's tough out there. It's, it's, it's very tough. And uh, the tendency for, for politicians is to uh, reduce taxes so the, the wealthiest people can donate money to the politicians so they can run for office. We don't need that. Right? We need people to pay taxes. <laughs> And we, we need to educate our young people to the highest degree so that they can be the most competitive in the world in all of the, the subjects that count, science, technology, engineering, math, all of those things that enable us to uh, have great jobs and have a great uh, standard of living. I know we talked about it earlier, the, the, the subject, you know, writings on the wall. And I'd like you to talk a little bit more about how you came up with that, that name because it, it's, it's fascinating to me how publishers come up with titles for books that grab your attention and you know there's some depth and some meaning behind it. Well, Stevie Wonder is one of um, the great poets of the 20th and 21st century. Um, his lyrics um, from very superstitious writings on the wall, mm -hmm. uh, when you believe in things that you don't understand, you suffer. And that's, uh, that's why uh, I chose that title, because um, too many Americans believe in stuff that they don't understand, and we're all suffering from it, and uh, things have to change. You know, what's cool, what... <laughs> in listening to you talk about that, when you talk about Stevie Wonder, I, I immediately started thinking, oh, Stevie Wonder, Ray Charles, I, th I start thinking of, of individuals who have 
a disability, whether, no matter what it is, whether they're blind or what, sometimes they have an extra sense. So the, the big person upstairs gives them an extra sense so that they can impart it upon us. But a lot of times, we don't see it like you see it. All we want to do is dab and do this and do all that other stuff. <laughs> I, I think um, a, a lot, of, especially people like Stevie, they, they have an insight that um, transcends uh, their, their handicap. They have to have a real insight into things. And uh, I think that's uh, what, what you're describing. I know that it's a very, very complicated situation that we have. Is, is the solution as simple as education? Well, I, I think it has to begin with education. I think it, we got to make it po possible to, uh, for, for more gainful employment. Um, that, that's one of the things that I, I've been waiting for the Republicans to, um, to come to the black community and talk about. You know, there are conservative solutions for chronic unemployment and uh, an educational system that doesn't work. And, they don't ever seem to have any answers. Uh, that's, that's really disappointing. Um, they're always claiming that uh, they want to be inclusive, but um, they marginalize and uh, ignore certain parts of society, and that's very unfortunate. What, what are your thoughts on the, on the current political... Yeah, you started laughing over there, I know. <laughs> and the political campaign that we're going through now because there are, this is unlike anything we've ever seen before. And True. one of the things that I hope does not happen on either side, somebody slips up and says something that will haunt them forever. Because in the heat of battle, you will say some things that, okay? And you guys here know what I'm talking about. So what I'm, so what I'm saying to you is and you agree this is something we've never seen before, how do we calm it down? How do we you know, calm the rhetoric down because it's getting crazier every day? I think uh, the, the, rhetoric, the rhetoric will calm down when we realize that uh, the people that we're talking about, all these other people in America that uh, we might not trust or we're leery of, they are the ones that are our fellow citizens. We have to get along with them. We can't go to Canada. You know, that doesn't work. It's too cold up there anyway. <laughs> I mean, we, we have to figure out how to make it work here for all of us. That, that, that's our job. And um, that's what the people in the Constitution said. The, Con the Continental Congress was, was tough. There were different factions. That, there were days when the people from New Hampshire didn't want to come, and uh, people from Virginia were like, no, we're not even speaking about this subject, and they had to get over their own biases mm -hmm. and their own idiosyncrasies and talk to each other uh, respectfully, and they had to listen. And when we learn to listen to each other without fear, um, just, all right, tell me what your issues are and why, and then I'll explain my side of it, and then maybe we can find common ground. That's how common ground is found, and it takes respect and appreciation for people who do not share your, your beliefs but you got to work with these people. And that, that's, that's what America is all about. That's why it's the greatest place in the world. Everybody from all over the world has come here and contributed, and it, it continues to happen. And, and it's the only place like that in the world. And that's why everybody wants to be here. I also think that's one of the great things about sports, too. Yeah. Because if you're... If you're a Laker, you put on that uniform, it's all the same. Doesn't make any difference what it is underneath that. That uniform is right there. So the only thing you care about is doing your job. Bill Belichick of the New England Patriots, just do your job. All right. I, I remember the first time uh, I went to China with the NBA. and you know, We played games. Couldn't talk to these guys. I, I don't speak Mandarin. But uh, just the fact that we played the same game and competed against each other, we, all of a sudden, we got common ground forever. You know, something that we all want to do and we all devote our time to. And it, it, it just tears down the differences between cultures and enables people to share. And uh, I, I think that's one of the great gifts of, of sports. This book, 
probably should be required reading, let's say, in the LA Unified School District. That'd be wonderful. <laughs> I'd love that, yeah. So anybody here who has any connections, we call it connecting the dots, okay? Thank you, okay? But we have to follow up on our, uh, you know, words mean a whole lot. You gonna help? Okay. You have a question? You have a question about what now? Something he wrote in the book? See, um, it's just like at Channel 2. <laughs> you cut the sportscaster short of his time. <laughs> I'll be doggone. It's called, it's called breaking news, right? <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, see, see, see. <laughs> don't, no, 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 no. Don't do that. Don't do that. Don't humor him. Don't humor him. Don't, don't, don't humor him. Now it's turned into a roast. We're trying to solve some very difficult problems right now. And you and this one over here get started. No. We want to start the question and answer session since you, what's your name, dear? Debbie. Who? Debbie. Debbie. Do we want to start the question and answer session since Debbie here has interrupted my flow? You want okay. to bring the, the, the yeah. microphone okay. to Debbie? Yeah, okay. Questions and answers, just raise your hand and I'll bring a microphone yeah. to you. Just a quick Debbie's reminder, right questions are Debbie. questions. They start with a W or an H and sometimes a D. Only Jim Hill gets to ask follow-up questions. And there is nothing like a two, no, we don't believe in two-part questions here. Thank you. Okay, so my question is uh, in your book where you're talking about basically history repeating itself and why does that happen? Why don't we learn from the lessons of the past? And one of the things you list as the reasons is the negligence of educators failing to teach properly. So having said that, um, have you thought about on this journey that you're on now, um, teaching at UCLA? Yeah. Either, uh, either, I know it's a grunge, boy, oh, boy do I know, two weeks into school and I'm like, when's summer? Um, but uh, even like an online course or something like that, to, to feel that that's part of your journey or part of your giving back to your community um, to properly educate people. Um, I haven't had the opportunity to uh, teach at UCLA. I did teach a history course uh, in Arizona when I coached. I coached in Arizona one season, and I taught a course to the Apaches on their history because the state wasn't teaching them about that. And um, things were, were going bad, and they found that um, when you take people from another culture like that, if you teach them in their own language, it really changes their idea about themselves and what they have to offer. So that's, that's happened uh, since I did that. And that was, uh, geez, it's almost 20 years ago that I did that. But uh, now that they're, they're teaching the kids uh, Apache and they're learning about their history in, in their own language, uh, they're doing a lot better and they have a much more self-esteem which enables them to, to do better. So, you know, I, I think that's, that's a key. The other thing is, do you have any pull over Westwood? <laughs> okay, next well, question is up here. Yeah, over here, Cap. Captain, this is a true honor. Like, growing up in L.A. and being here for 45 years almost, it's just been seeing you and seeing your life progression is amazing. So my question is about your, the way you expanded your mind through martial arts and through your love of jazz. Um, towards the end of your career, not many people had the type of career where they were able to maintain such high level of discipline and productivity. I'd like to know like, what you thought about, like, were there artists that you reflected upon when you were reaching the end of your career, like an Ellington or a Bruce Lee or a Dr. Harry Edwards that kind of put you in a mind state to, be, to continue that success for such a long time and that amount of like consistency which shows through your writing as well. Well, uh, it, wasn't it though? Uh, for me, uh, all of the influences I, I had throughout my life really, they kind of accumulated. So I watched the Brooklyn Dodgers and admired them. And then um, I met Bruce Lee when I was at UCLA and I learned from him. And I learned from other people, you know, Oscar Robertson, and I, I get to, 
to play with incredible athletes like Magic and James Worthy and Jamal and all those guys. And you know, that, that's how it goes. You know, you you get uh, you get to rolling and you you're able to, to pick and choose the other people that, that are rolling too and you kind of make an alliance and you get a lot more done. Thank you for your question. Hello, um, I just want to say I'm a huge fan and I really appreciate the things you said about women and being inclusive, but I really want to get your take on mental illness and how you feel that, because you, you mentioned education being a real big problem, but I also think that you talk about systematic racism or institutional racism, but where does mental illness really come in when, when it comes to that? Well, I, I think uh, mental illness is such a random thing. It, it happens uh, when it happens. You know, you never know where exactly it's, it's going to strike. I, I went through it with, with my dad. He had senile dementia, and uh, the last eight years of his life, uh, he lived with me, and uh, it was tough on me, you know. Uh, the doctor told me it was going to be tougher on me than it was my dad, and I, I didn't understand it until I went through the process with him. So it's, uh, it, it's, it's part of the burdens that we have to bear, uh, the thing about mental illness. But I, I'm happy that uh, Hillary is talking about having a, a mental illness uh, um, focus on it, with regard to health reform and uh, training our police officers to deal with people who have mental illness so they don't end up shooting them or you know all of the bad things that happen because they don't know how to cope with uh, those kind of issues i think that that that's a real key and getting people help earlier always helps you know because then we we don't end up with so many of these crazy tragic things that happen you know somebody loses their mind and starts shooting and you know killing people or they kill themselves, it's, uh, it, it can be real bad. So uh, just having a, a realistic approach to mental health issues will a a absolutely make the quality of life better here and, and, and it will save lives. Uh, Kareem, I um, appreciate what you said about mental health. My father was mentally ill and he took his life, so I appreciate you uh, mentioning that. And it's also an honor to be here with my son and, and uh, Paul in your career. My question is, uh, reading books with, on Bill Walton, his relationship with John Wooden, what was your relationship with Coach Wooden during the 60s? And you mentioned sitting with uh, Muhammad Ali when he made his announcement. And what, what kind of uh, interactions did you have with him? Well, I, I had a really good relationship with Coach Wooden. And you know, he was an English teacher. I was an English major. I, I, had, I was a double major. English and history, but because I was an English major, I could talk to him about stuff that had nothing to do with hoops, and it really enabled us to, to get to know each other uh, in, in a much more intimate way and dealing with other issues. Uh, Coach Wooden was motivated by his Christian faith. That's, that's what he wanted. He wanted to uh, make sure that all the guys that played for him figured out what it meant to be a good teammate, to be a good father, to be a good parent, um, be a good husband, a good citizen. That's what he wanted for us. He wanted us to get our degrees and, and learn how to uh, be part of a team in a meaningful way uh, without a selfish focus. And that, that's what it was all about. Um, I don't know what he went through with Bill. I, I remember him talking uh, about um, two of the players that were before me, Keith Erickson and Gail Goodridge. And Keith was kind of jealous about Gail. He said, well, Why'd you get all those shots for Gail? And you didn't get me more shots. And uh, he said, if you'd gotten more shots for me, I, I might have got drafted higher. <laughs> and um, Coach Wooden told, told Keith, if, if I'd gotten you more shots, you wouldn't have been drafted at all. <laughs> <laughs> Coach was great with the, with. When he needed to have it, Coach was great with the put down. He, he, <laughs> he wasn't into it, but um, if, if you needed it, he, he could put you down pretty quickly. Yeah. And um, he, he knew exactly what he was talking about. It was, it was a great time with him. I, I, was, um, I was with him only three hours before he passed away. I went, went to see him and he was comatose, so I couldn't communicate. Uh, but um, 
I shared a moment with him, and his daughter Nell said, don't, don't worry about it. He, he knew that you were here in the room. Um, I, I got to believe that. He, he's a wonderful man. I miss him very much. Yeah, John Wooden was, uh, and, and he had a wonderful way of convincing people to stop doing what they, you know, the, you, know you heard the story about Bill Walton? Let me tell you, can I tell that story about Bill Walton? Walton, as we know, was a rebel, right? So they were, they were, that's right. They were picketing and marching in Westwood, right by the campus. And Coach Wooden said, you know, uh, so he called Bill in. He said, Bill, you have every right to picket, to protest, whatever you want. You have every right to go out there in those streets and do that. And he says, and you know what? When you do, we're going to miss you on our basketball team. <laughs> That's a pretty convincing way of convincing him not to do anything, right? Yeah. Okay, two more questions. Kareem, uh, uh, thank you for being here today, and thank you for, for your book. I am for everything that you've done for this city. Um, my question comes from a place right now of, of discouragement. I see what's happening around us, and uh, the, the, this persistent... Uh, anger and racism that we see around us is, is discouraging, frankly. We, we think we've made progress and then, and then we see what we see. Uh, you made a very interesting point about people finding a way to speak to each other reasonably. People of different viewpoints, people who might disagree on things, but treating each other with respect and having dialogue. And here we have all these means for that. We have the internet. Um, and yet it becomes a place where trolls hurl insults. Even our, our great political parties have given platforms to, to hatred. You, do you, who, who speak of institutional racism, do you think there's a way that we can create an institution of some kind or a platform of some kind for dialogue between people of good faith? Dialogue between white and black people, pe people that don't understand each other today that, and that should. And what can we do to make that happen? Well, um, the, the dialogue is very simple. All we have to do is just get that document out. It's called the U.S. Constitution. And um, that, that's a great way to establish a dialogue. Just follow the formula given to us in, in the Constitution. That's what really works. Um, the whole idea of us not uh, being able to accept people who don't look exactly like us I think that's very deeply ingrained in the human psyche. Um, just the different tribes that, when we all lived in the, in the forest and didn't have great civilizations, um, you, you didn't trust the people that didn't look just like you. And that kind of got hard, hardwired. So we have to overcome that. But it's very easy to overcome. And when you understand uh, what it is about people, uh, their honesty and their willingness to, to befriend people, that's really the, the, the key issue. And people who have that ability, those are the people that you, you talk to because they'll listen to you and um, they'll be able to communicate with you in a way that uh, you can listen to them. And that, that's, that's where the progress comes. Thank you for your question. And our final question for the evening. Yes. First and foremost, thank you so much for being such an ambassador for peace to really all of humanity. Um, well, your you. presence is truly inspirational. My question is really for um, advice that you can give for people like myself who know no other home but, but America, who I always say, you know, I'm as, I'm as American as apple pie, but I may not look the part, right? Um, what advice can you give people of such minorities, whether they spouse of faith or culture, whatever identity that they have that's not of the majority, for us to really keep going and being that change that we want to see? Because it's, it's tough out there. It's hard. And um, what, what can keep us going from the inspiration, from your inspiration and from your background that you can give to us? Uh, tokens of advice. Well, I, I would tell you that um, I always go to history. Um, as a Muslim, uh, you should know about the Muslims uh, here in America that helped bring America into existence. That would be some of the slaves from West Africa that, that fought the Continental Army and were given their freedom. One of them was the hero of the Battle of uh, Bunker Hill, a guy named Peter Salim. Um, he, uh, at a crucial time, 
he, he was a sharpshooter and he uh, shot dead uh, a British soldier, uh, a British officer that was rallying the troops uh, and they were threatening to overrun our troops that, were, that had run out of ammunition and were trying to make a, a retreat. Peter Salem uh, shot this individual and uh, saved the day. That was a, a, a Muslim who uh, was one of the heroes of, of the Revolutionary War. The very first country to recognize America as a sovereign state was the Kingdom of Morocco. Uh, Moroccan troops fought with the French contingent, both uh, infantry and cavalry. For, uh, the Comte de Lafayette had Moroccan troops with him. Okay, so mis Muslims participated in establishing our country. They've been here the whole time, and people don't understand that. So, <laughs> just knowing your own history and um, what your or your particular uh, group of people contributed to what makes America great is all you have to know, that you belong and uh, respect our, our laws and our traditions and you'll, get, you'll be just like everybody else. Uh, no matter where they came from, that's what we all do. Thank you for your question. <laughs> Hold, hold, one more, one final thing, one final thing, one final thing, one final thing. No, 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 it's serious about this. It's not often that we are in the presence of pure, true, unadulterated greatness. And tonight, we are. <laughs>